weekend, we are starting a brand new series called Stay Salt. I'll explain why. Um, Basically, we loved the title and we love this book. And so this series is based on a book by a lady called Rebecca Manley Pippet. Some of you may remember a book that she wrote um, yonkers ago um, called Out of the Salt Shaker. So she is someone who travels right around the world. She's lived in Europe and Australia, talking to people about how to share and show the love of Jesus. And Tim Keller actually really rates this book. This is a pretty big commendation, but he says this may be the best book on evangelism for the next generation. So we're going to have some copies for sale next Sunday, and we'd love you to grab one. If we sell out, we'll order some more. But why salt? Why salt? Well, the Bible mentions salt over 40 times. In the Old Testament, it was used as a preservative, as a disinfectant, as a currency, and required as part of each sacrificial offering given by the Israelites as they worshipped the one true God. God instructed Moses to tell his people in Leviticus 2.13, add salt to all your offerings. To all your offerings. Add salt. As a chemical compound, salt can't change. It has an inherent purity about it. And God instructed uh, Moses to tell the Israelites to add salt because it symbolised the reality that God wanted every sacrifice to come from a pure heart. It was not so much about the outward, which was a, was a, was a picture of the sacrifice that Jesus would come and make on our behalf, but it was every outward sacrifice, actually, that God cared more about what was going on in people's heart. In ancient cultures, sharing salt at a table was also a symbol of covenant. It meant you had a deep and permanent relationship that couldn't be broken. Today we can buy salt everywhere, right? It's pretty cheap, but in Jesus' day, salt was not that easy to come by. It had to be harvested by pouring salt water from the sea into a pit and then letting it evaporate. The water evaporates, so you're left with the salt crystals. And actually in the Roman Empire, it was so important and valuable that Roman soldiers were sometimes paid in salt. Can you imagine that? Great job, here's your pay. Salt, thank you. (laughs) But Jesus says that's what his followers are meant to be like. That's what we're meant to be like as a church, salt. There's meant to be a flavour of Christ-likeness, a sparkle of joy and an unselfishness about those who claim to follow Christ that stands out in this world. That people go, what is that that's different about you? It's incredibly attractive when people see that the spirit of Christ and the love of Jesus operating in our lives. In Matthew chapter five, Jesus goes up on this mountain and he calls his disciples to them and he starts to teach them. And what follows are nine statements that are known as the Beatitudes, where he talks about what it means to be blessed. And actually that word blessed means to be made happy in God, to be made happy in God. Jesus is saying that life in his kingdom or life with him is a life of profound joy, a joy that no person and no circumstance can take away. Anyone and everyone who hears and truly believes God raised the crucified Jesus from the dead and invites Him to leave their lives will receive God's astonishing gift of grace, undeserved forgiveness, unearned favour, intimate relationship with God as your heavenly Father and this rock solid guarantee that you will spend eternity in heaven with Him. But straight after the Beatitudes, the very next verse, Jesus says to His disciples in Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavour? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. In other words, this made happy in God life that Jesus gives us or offers us and gives us is not just for you and I to keep to ourselves. What about the message paraphrase of the same verse? It says, Jesus says, let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavours of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? 
You've lost your youthfulness and will end up in the garbage. Like pretty strong words from Jesus. He tells it to us straight. Flavourless salt is not salt, is salt that can't actually fulfil its purpose. If it doesn't have flavour, it can't fulfil its purpose. And anyone who's received this free gift of grace and said yes to following Him is to show and share the love of Christ with others, to stay salt. It's like a, Jesus is saying, the idea that a Christian who doesn't share and show the love of Christ exists is like not happening in his mind. They're, they, they're supposed to go together. And so like the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4a, I don't know how you walked in here today. Some days we walk in and we, f- we feel the blessed, right? We're like, yeah, life is good. Here I am, I'm at church. Other days we cr- it's like we're crawling. <laughs> I made it. Because <laughs> you feel like the whole week's been real, a real struggle. But you might be hard pressed on every side. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 4 8. You might be hard pressed on every side. But if you're a Christ follower, you're not crushed. The Holy Spirit will help you as you lean the full weight of your trust on Jesus. God has faithfully promised to rescue, like Rachel said this morning, and deliver His children from every evil attack, to give us a way out of every temptation, to be a very present help in every trouble. Until in his perfect timing, he brings us safely home to heaven. You might be perplexed. You might not understand what's going on at the moment, but you're not in despair. Jesus' disciples always have a reason to hope. Our Saviour King has overcome the grave and is seated at the right hand of the Father, sovereign over all, and he's praying for you continually and right now. He's interceding for you. You might even be persecuted, ridiculed or demeaned for your faith in Christ, but know this, you are never, ever, ever, and I could keep going for hours, abandoned by Jesus. Nothing can separate us from His love and He has promised to never leave us or forsake us. You might feel struck down or discouraged or even be walking through a time of grief or depression. The Lord knows right where you are. And what a great mercy in Christ, we are not destroyed. God is for you. God is with you. He will lovingly shepherd you through this time and demonstrate his faithfulness to you. You might feel struck down, but Christ's followers are always blessed, made happy in God. That can be the worst thing going on in your life, but we can be reassured by his presence. We can be comforted by his promises. Even though outwardly things may look anything but okay, we are blessed. But what about those people in our lives and our spheres of influence who are hard pressed, but they don't know Jesus? What about our friends and our work colleagues or our neighbours who are perplexed and confused, but they don't know the good shepherd who wants to minister to their souls? What about people we come into contact with who are overlooked and demeaned or desperately lonely, but who haven't yet heard there is one who sticks closer than a brother? What about our loved ones who are struck down by sickness or strain in relationships, who are devastated by their own or others' destructive choices, who are struggling with their mental health or have experienced trauma or injustice? but they don't know that there's one who came to transform our hearts and our minds and bring us back to life. Luke 19.10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Without Christ, we are lost. We're lost in our dead-end lives lost in our selfishness, 
lost in trying to make sense of what's going on around us without his help. Lost and separated from the God who made us. I want to read to you a quote from this book by Rebecca Manley Pippet. It says, she says, Never has there been a greater need to share Christ with the world, starting with our own neighbour, and never have believers felt more ill-equipped. While in most parts of the world, Christianity is growing dramatically, this is not the case in the West. Europe and Canada and Australia are secular, post-Christian. Statistics suggest that America is moving decidedly in the same direction. Influential voices are increasingly hostile, antagonistic. While in most parts of the world, Christianity is growing dramatically, this is not the case in the West. The major currents shaping our culture present real challenges for the gospel. Some Christians feel angry about this. Some Christians feel intimidated by this. Some Christians feel defeated by this. I feel hopeful. Why would she say that? Why would she say, I feel hopeful? Well, let's read on a little bit more. We are living in challenging times for the gospel, but we're also living in remarkable times that are full of opportunities for the gospel. Even as our cultural landscape becomes increasingly secular, secularism does not have the power to erase our human longings for meaning and worth. If anything, it increases them. God has placed a longing for identity and meaning and purpose in all human hearts. So even if people can't quite articulate why they feel or what they feel they're missing, the longing and the wistfulness of there, maybe when their child is born, or they see a sunrise, or they have a moment where they sense something transcendent, our hearts cry out, there's got to be more. And so we can, and I really sense the Holy Spirit wants to encourage us with this this morning through God's Word, remain hopeful. Remain hopeful. Because though our context and culture have changed, the power of the gospel has not changed. It is the power, speaking about Jesus and what He's done and who He is, it is the power to save. Not how we explain it, not whether we bumble it and fumble it out, but just speaking about who Jesus is and what He has done, it is the power to save those who believe. Because as people are hearing it, the Holy Spirit is going like fireworks are going off on the inside of them, so they either push it away or open up their hearts a little bit more. The amazing inheritance we have in Jesus and the resources God has given to all Christians in every age remains the same and our age looks a lot more like the book of Acts than 60 years ago. Increasingly hostile, but so many opportunities. And so this series is going to help us find effective ways to share our faith, even with and especially with all the challenges that today's world presents. Our task is to keep learning how to apply all that we've received from God so that we can witness to the truth about Him in ways that are effective and that connect with people today. The Apostle Paul kept learning. He, had, he was always on a learning journey. You think about in Acts 17, he went to the city of Athens, which this was the centre of learning for the then known world. In Acts 18, he went to the city of Corinth, which was the centre of trade in the ancient world. In Acts 19, he went to the city of Ephesus, which was the centre of religious activity and um, pluralistic worship and the occult. And in each of those settings, the content of the gospel was the same, what it's about. But he started in different places and he applied it to the people who were listening in different ways. We think of Paul as this fearless warrior who never got intimidated and that was definitely not the case. 
In 1 Corinthians 2, we get a picture of how he was feeling when he got to Corinth. And it says, well, he says, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. Doesn't that make you go, okay, cool. If Paul feels like that, like I feel like that sometimes. It makes me feel relieved. Good on you, Paul, for being honest. But why was he intimidated? What was it about Corinth that intimidated him? It was the well-known pride and immorality of the people who lived in Corinth. Paul knew the cross of Jesus comes into direct collision with both. It was gonna be a culture clash. People are either gonna push it away or open up their hearts. Because the Corinthians' intellectual arrogance is something he addresses in his letters to the church in Corinth. They were proud of their city, they were proud of their wealth, they were proud of their culture and its political prestige, but the cross of Jesus undermines all human pride. It insists that all of us have fallen short of God's perfect standard and have absolutely nothing with which to buy or contribute to our rescue or our salvation. It's only a gift that we can receive. Corinth was also a place where anything goes, morally speaking. The sexual promiscuity of Corinth was well known. Behind the city, around 600 metres above sea level, stood the temple of Aphrodite or Venus, the goddess of love. A thousand female slaves served her and roamed the city streets at night as prostitutes. But the gospel of Christ crucified, called Corinthians to repentance and holiness. He knew there was gonna be a clash of cultures. As new creations in Christ, we now belong to Jesus and have been bought with a price. It cost Him His blood to rescue us from the kingdom of darkness and bring us to Himself. Our bodies are no longer our own, but rather temples of the Holy Spirit. We are to honour God with our bodies. And the Bible clearly teaches that God designed sexual intimacy to take place within the covenantal commitment of marriage between one man and one woman for life. This design not only testifies to the intimacy between Christ and His church and the possibility of procreation of children, but it also affirms the high value God places on protecting us. Because of the desire to run our own lives, sinful human tendency is to use and abuse sex and other people to satisfy ourselves and make sexual expression the most important thing we value. But having been forgiven of all our sin, Christ followers are called to follow Jesus and His way. A life of surrender to God. Loving Him above all else and putting others first, whether that means chastity in singleness or purity in marriage. Jesus calls us to repentance and holiness. And so Jesus knew that Paul was feeling intimidated when he arrived in Corinth. And in Acts 18, we read how Jesus personally comes and he encourages him. In in the message, it says, one night the master master spoke to Paul in a dream. Keep it up. Don't let anyone intimidate or silence you. No matter what happens, I'm with you and no one is gonna be able to hurt you. You have no idea how many people I have on my side in this city. And that was all Paul needed to stick it out. He stayed another year and a half faithfully teaching the Word of God to the Corinthians. In the NIV, the second part of verse 10, it says, No one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. And sometimes we think, oh no, how could God use me? You don't know. God knows in His purpose the people in your life that are, he, he is calling and opening their hearts. The Good Shepherd, Jesus says in John 10, you need to know that I have other sheep in addition to those in this pen. I need to gather and bring them too. 
And so I believe he's encouraging us today, like he came to encourage Paul. There are people in your life who've not yet believed in him, but they will do so. Because already according to his purpose, they belong to him. He's encouraging us like he encouraged Paul, keep it up. Don't let anyone intimidate or silence you. No matter what happens, I'm with you and no one is going to be able to hurt you. In fact, I already know those who are gonna open up their hearts and respond. Will you trust me for my protection as you step out in faith and ask me to lead you to the people I already have in this city? We can remain hopeful. We can remain hopeful as Jesus encourages us. I also really feel that God wants to encourage us this morning through this word to remove the roadblocks. You know like when you go to use a salt and pepper shaker and there's like all these crusty bits and it gets blocked and you've got to unscrew it and clean it all out so the salt can flow through. Sometimes there's blockages in how we see ourselves or how we see God that actually can cause us to shrink back rather than the love of God flow through us and we show and speak a word for Jesus. In this book, Rebecca said she's interviewed thousands of people around the world wherever she's travelled to share and train people. And typical reasons why we don't share our faith today, three things are common right across the world. We feel inadequate. What if I offend? Do you ever think that? I do. That question pops up, what if I offend? Well, the gospel actually may offend. Paul knew that. Like if if it's calling people to lay down the leadership of their own lives and say, Jesus is Lord, and they don't want to do that, that's probably going to offend them. The gospel might offend and challenge our self-sufficiency. It will offend and challenge our pride. But there's a difference between the gospel offending and the way we do it offending. Because then people can't see the gospel. And so we can learn to grow more loving. (laughs) And this series is gonna give us practical ways to do that. How can we be more loving in how we share the gospel? So that the way that we're doing it is not putting barriers in people's place to hear what Jesus is saying to them. The Holy Spirit's resources are limitless and he can continue to go on a journey. Say, Lord, help me to grow more loving. In Acts 1.8, in the message, it says, Jesus says to his followers, what you'll get is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be able, you will be able to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all over Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. In Ephesians 3.20, in the Living Bible, it says, Now glory be to God, who by his mighty power at work within us is able to do far more than we could ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts or hopes. The second reason that Rebecca found that people are hesitant, we are hesitant to share our faith is that we lack confidence. Do you ever feel like that? It's okay to admit it. Paul lacked confidence. And the question we often ask with that is what if I'm rejected? What if I'm rejected? People may reject us for our faith in Christ. That's the reality of being a follower of Jesus. But the Lord will never reject us. Psalm 27.10 says, Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. And our goal is to please and delight Him who is already pleased with us. Sort of like a weird 
paradox. He's pleased with us in Christ. If we're follow, following Jesus, He loves us. There's nothing we can add to our salvation. And so our response, our heart response is we want to delight and please Him. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, so whether we're here in this body or away from this body called home to heaven, our goal is to please Him. It challenges that people-pleasing tendency that we all have. (laughs) Our goal is to please Him. And Jesus delights when we speak a word for Him. Whether people reject Him or people accept Him, He loves it when you say a word for Him. Galatians 1.10 says, I'm not trying to please people. I wanna please God. Do you think I'm trying to please people? If I were doing that, I would not be a servant of Christ. We can be confident in the love, the acceptance and the commissioning of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 again, starting at 18, verse 18 in the message. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. And God has given us the task of telling everyone what He's doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ Himself now, church. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. The last reason that Rebecca identified is that we don't. We think we ha- we don't know enough. Do you ever feel like that? I don't know enough about the Bible. Like, what if they ask me a question that I can't answer? Just be honest. That's a really good question. I have no idea. <laughs> it's okay to say that and, and say, but I am going to go check it out, talk to some people or find a book or find some more information and I'll get back to you. But great question. I want to know that too. That's refreshing to people. When we try and pretend that we've got it all together, people are like, you come across like a know-it-all. Honesty is best. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, since God has so generously let us in on what He's doing, we're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we run into some occasional hard times. We refuse to wear masks and play games. We don't manoeuvre and manipulate behind the scenes. And we don't twist God's word to suit ourselves. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open, the whole truth on display, so that those who want to can see and judge for themselves in the presence of God. What if I offend? What if I'm rejected? What if I don't have the right answer? Do you know, as I was reflecting on those three questions this week, I actually realised they're all about us. They're not about Jesus or other people who, need, who are lost. They're actually about us. And so we can ask the Holy Spirit to help us remove those roadblocks. Do you know what? They're getting in the way of me being who you've called me to be, God. Sharing the hope and the, good, the love of Christ with people is not just for Pastor Phil or Pastor Sam. It's not just for pastors and ministers. It's the job of the whole church. as fumbling and as bumbling and as bad as we think we do it. (laughs) It's actually about Jesus and it's actually about other people who need to hear. We can remain hopeful and we can remove the roadblocks with the Holy Spirit's help. But we can also stay salt. Tim Keller Uh, says this in his influential book, Evangelism in the Early Church. Oxford theologian, Anglican priest and Christian apologist, Michael Green estimates that 80% or more of evangelism in the early church was done not by ministers or evangelists, but by ordinary Christians explaining themselves to their network of relatives and close associates. They just went around gossiping about the gospel. 
casually dropping God into conversations and just seeing if a door opened up. Asking God to fill them with the love of God so that people can see it in their eyes and it oozes out of them. Saying, God, use me today. Use me. Lead me to those people who you are already seeking. Open up their hearts. Use me today. I was in a wedding earlier this year. I was in the bridal party and getting my makeup done. Interestingly, my kids didn't recognise me <laughs> after they did. I don't really usually wear a lot of makeup, so it was pretty funny. Um, anyway, so we're getting we're playing these beautiful songs of about God's peace and worship songs in the background. And the lady doing the makeup um, was like, "What is it about this room? There's such a vibe in this room." So peaceful. And she was tearing up in her eyes. And I thought, oh, well, that's a bit of an opportunity. All right, Lord, here we go. Say a quick prayer. And I said, well, that's the Holy Spirit. That's God's presence that you can sense. He loves you and he wants you to know him. And we had the most amazing chat about how she used to go to church with her grandparents and God just opened up this whole convo. I went to a relative's 70th the other week and he stood up and talked about, he's not a Christian, just stood up and talked about how it was the prayers of some of the people in that room, some of our extended family, that helped him in a very difficult time. I was like, oh, I see the openness, there it is. God's doing something in you. So, mate, I went to town and what I wrote in my card... <laughs> So you're 70, praise God. I'm going to write in a loving way. It's okay. But God, I pray that you know Jesus' love. I pray that you know his presence. I pray that you know how much he's for you. May you be blessed. You can do a lot with what you write in cards. If you've got relationship with people, right? I went to pick up my kids from school and there was a big screw that went into one of the tyres and the tyre went flat and... I don't know how to change the tile. I know how to change the tile on another car, but not that car. So I was like, oh, here we go. Um, and this guy came running along and saw we were in a bit of a predicament and offered to help. Thank you, Jesus. And um, I just struck up a bit of a conversation with him, particularly about his name, because his name was Emmanuel. And I'm like, oh, that's a pretty cool name. Do you know what that name means? He's like, I think so. I said, it means God with us. How cool is that? And he's like, oh. Oh, yeah, okay. Anyway, so we're just chatting, talking about his, what he does with his life or whatever. And I go to put a few things in the back of the car and my son, Callan, goes, Mom, not that subtly, invite him to church. <laughs> I'm like, all right, okay, well, let's just, let's just continue getting to know him. And, you know, at the end of the, the, the time when he finished, I just thanked him so much. I said, hey, listen, um, if you ever are in the Western suburbs, we go to a great church family and you're absolutely welcome to come. But I thought, good on you, Callan. That's great. Colossians 4, 5 to 6 says, Conduct yourself with wisdom in your interactions with outsiders or non-believers. Make the most of each opportunity, not treating it as something we have to endure, but treating it as something precious. Because if you ask God to open your eyes to the opportunities, He will. He will show you and there's opportunity after opportunity. After, it might be the checkout person that you talk to. It might be someone at the, the bus stop as you're sitting next to them and you start a conversation. God will show you and he'll start to help you see people the way he sees people. Let your speech at all times be gracious and pleasant. We think as Christians that our speech, and it should be, be gracious and pleasant. That's awesome. But then what does it say? Seasoned with... It's not enough just to be gracious and pleasant. It's supposed to be seasoned with salt. Opening ourselves up to those opportunities to say, Lord, would you help me say a word for you today? Sometimes when I'm talking to people, I'm like, just, okay, Jesus, here we go. I'm ready. What do you got? You love this person, let's go. Nothing. Other times I'm praying that and there's this amazing conversation that opens up. The work of evangelism is for all believers. And over the next seven weeks, we're going to be unpacking hows 
And it's actually going to be really practical and really encouraging for all of us because the gospel is visible. People are meant to see something salty about our life, right? Try looking in the mirror this week and smiling. People might even ask you, why are you smiling? (laughs) It's meant to be visible. People are meant to see, we're meant to stand out. There's meant to be something different about you that is attractive, that that is pointing and reflecting people to Jesus. Don't try and fit in when He's called you to stand out. Compelled by the love of God, the gospel is visible. The gospel is also verbal. Throughout the book of Acts, you see it. You know, we think in this culture, if we just live it, that's enough. No, it's not. How will they know unless they hear? The word of faith that comes by hearing about Jesus, God starts to stir faith in people's heart as they hear about Jesus. The gospel is visible, we have to speak. Do not be intimidated, do not be silenced. We have to do it in a, with wisdom and respect and gentleness, of course, but we have to speak. We can be confident in the Holy Spirit's enabling. We're gonna talk about this throughout the series, how we do that. The gospel is also invitational. As we show compassion towards those who are lost, we're inviting them to read a gospel. We're inviting them to church. We're inviting them to examine the claims of Christ. We're inviting them to open themselves up and start talking to God and experiencing His presence and power. We're inviting them. Hey, have you ever thought about what it was like to follow Jesus? I know you've been thinking about this for a while. Or Are you ready to receive Christ? It's invitational. The results are up to him. I I once prayed, God, I don't care if I never personally lead anyone to Christ. I want to play my part. I want to play my part. Even if it's only a tiny little signpost in the road for their journey towards Jesus. I want to play my part. And so we're going to come around the Lord's table this morning. We're going to remember what it costs Jesus. Jesus. And we're going to ask him to help us. Can we pray together? Father God, I thank you for this series. I just believe it's going to be very um, powerful right across our church family. I thank you for your word. I thank you for those watching at home. I thank you that we can choose to go on a journey with you over the next seven weeks and start or renew our commitment to intentionally adopt missional living in our daily lives, in the people you bring us into contact with in our relationships. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, His love has the first and last word in everything we do. Our firm decision. Notice it doesn't say our feeling. Depending if the circumstances are going awesome. Our firm, Paul made a, he was trembling and weak, but he made a firm decision. When I go to Corinth, I'm going to preach Christ and Him crucified. And the Holy Spirit anointed him to do that, enabled him to do that. Our firm decision is to work from this focus centre. One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could be also included in his life. A resurrection life. A far better life than people ever lived on their own. Ushers, could you come and just distribute these elements, they're symbols, they're pictures, they're reminders, they represent what Jesus has done for us. 
little bit of juice represents that He willingly came for us. He came into our mess, came to seek and save us. And through the shedding of His blood, He paid for our wrongdoing. He paid for our rebellion against God. He died not for His own sins, but for ours. And He did it because He loves us. A little piece of biscuit represents His body that was broken for us. You were bought with a price. It cost Jesus so much to buy you back from the kingdom of darkness and bring you into his family. Just consider that. And as you consider it, the Bible says we're to examine ourselves. Have you had some roadblocks? Have you been angry at the things you see in this world that move away from the values of, and the teachings of Christ? This morning, He wants you to lay that down at the foot of the cross so the life and power of His Spirit can flow through you. Have you been feeling defeated? Jesus is reminding you this morning that he's defeated sin and death. He's encouraging you, don't be silent, don't be intimidated. You have the Holy Spirit. lacked confidence Paul lacked confidence but he also said Jesus encouraged him there's many people in this city who belong to me and my grace is sufficient for you my power is made perfect not in your strength, but in your weakness. Would you just talk to him about one of those things? Maybe it's a few, those roadblocks that you felt have been there. Say, today, Lord, in response to your love for me, I'm making a firm decision to stay salt. Stay salt.